It kind of blows my mind to consider the fact that we're up to nearly 600 episodes of this podcast, the 10% Happier Podcast. That's a lot of conversations. I, I like to think of it as a great compendium of, and I know this is a bit of a grandiose term, but wisdom. The only downside of having this vast library of audio is that it can be hard to know where to start. So we're launching a new feature here, playlists. Just like you put together a playlist of your favorite songs. Back in the day, we used to call those mixtapes. Just like you do that with music, you can do it with podcasts. So if you're looking for episodes about anxiety, we've got a playlist of all of our anxiety episodes. Or if you're looking for how to sleep better, we've got a playlist for that. We've even put together a playlist of some of my personal favorite episodes. That was a hard list to make. Check out our playlists at 10percent.com slash playlist. That's 10%, all one word spelled out, dot com slash playlist, singular. Let us know what you think. We're always open to tweaking how we do things, and maybe there's a playlist we haven't thought of. Hit me up on Twitter or submit a comment through the website. From ABC, this is the 10% Happier Podcast. I'm Dan Harris. My guest today is one of the best chefs on planet Earth, and I say that with zero hyperbole. He's been responsible for some of the best culinary experiences of my entire life. He's got a restaurant empire that ranges from New York City to L.A. to Hong Kong to Boston. He's written 10 cookbooks. He's also the host of The Chew on ABC. And somehow in the midst of all that, he finds time to meditate. He is Mario Batali, ladies and gentlemen. And we recorded this podcast at one of his restaurants in downtown Manhattan, which I have always referred to as Otto, but is actually Oto. Oto, for Oto. the number eight, because we are on 8th Street. Oh, there you go. All right, we, we are ostensibly a meditation podcast, so let me just start with that. Okay. When, why, where, how did you start meditating? I started meditating six years ago after having a couple of dinners with Jerry and Jessica Seinfeld, who of which Jerry is a huge fan of TM through the David Lynch Foundation. Transcendental Meditation. And they turned me on to this guy, Bob Roth, who runs the David Lynch Foundation. And I took his classes for uh, like three lessons. And then I started doing it. And I must say, it changed just about everything. Unpack that for me a little bit. Specifically, did, what did it change? I'm in a high-pressure, high-tension situation almost every day, if you allow it to become that. And what I had how I had been processing my overloaded days and information was slightly losing my temper every now and then, even if not outside, visible to the outside. And what I realized, I, I could figure this out. I mean, I, I box four days a week. I play squash two days a week. So I'm pretty set up in the exercise department. And I just wasn't able to rid myself of little bits of anger, like waiting in line for a long time of a traffic and someone not turning. Or someone in my team not doing exactly what I told them to do, or even close to what I told or them to do. Or people being noisy in the middle right, of the right, podcast. Right, exactly, yeah. which, is, which happens. And what I found that if after about a month of doing TM, which for me, they're all the same. It, like, like as I love your 10% happier piece, and, and I love the TM piece, and, but I love people that don't even have a practice way of doing it. But they find a way to quietly calm their soul once or twice a day because that's just what they think is a good idea. Some of it's spiritual, some of it's not spiritual, it's physical. But, but what worked for me is I realized that if I could find 20 minutes to scrape both the top foamy part of my sea of mentality <laughs> and get to the profound non-moving depths of that same sea, I could find a place somewhere lower to the bottom than nearer to the top to spend most of my time. And it, and it allowed me to more carefully or more slowly react to something that was offending me, bothering me, pissing me off, or totally enraging me. And in that minute that you take to think, how am I going to respond to this? The meditation has given me a much firmer base from which not to shoot as quickly or as loudly or as defensively as I might have in the past. You, you, for, those of us, uh, for those who don't know anything about TM or Transcendental Meditation, how does it work? It's like most meditation. They give you um, a mantra, but I don't think it's crucial that someone gives it to you. You could decide that I want to do water glass. It's the idea is that you repeat it in your mind to the point that almost like a Zen tea service, you can remove your mind from the equation as you just sit there and quietly and mindfully try to find a calm place. And the mantra 
is something that keeps you focused on the low end. But as with all meditation, well, maybe not with all, but of all the ones that I've learned, we accept the fact that you will wander off into your mind and suddenly you're thinking about something and you're moving more quickly than your intention is. But as opposed to looking like that as a failure, you realize when you realize it that you go back into the mantra or the quietness or the mindful silence in your heart or whatever you want to call it. For me, it's not so spiritual. For me, it's much more about finding calm, which I know every being has a calm somewhere. And how often do you do it and when and where? I do it twice a day. 20 minutes a time? 20 each? minutes twice a day. And what, how, you, you, I want to talk about your schedule in a second, but wh- when do you do it in your day? If I'm shooting um, The Chew, we are in at 7.30, we rehearse until about 8, then we roll at 9. So between 8 and 9, and then before dinner time. If I'm not rehearsing The Chew, it's generally after I get up, which is about the same every day. I get up around 5, 5.30, if I'm sleeping in. And I get up, I start my day, I figure out what's going on for the kids' breakfast. I make sure the dog goes out and takes a pee. I come back upstairs. Before anyone else gets up, I have probably an hour sometimes, so I can read a little bit of the newspaper. But I start with uh, meditation. So talk to me about your schedule, because just from an outsider, it seems ridiculous. You are on the chew every morning. Yeah. Uh, you have 7,000 restaurants by my count. 28. Okay, 28. Uh, you uh, I have a new show on Vice. Uh, we're doing our second pilot, um, but yeah, that's okay. So that's in soon. the works. Yeah, uh, you you do a lot of charity work. You've written a bu- just about once a week. Uh, you've written a bunch of books. I think I said ten, eleven now. Uh, well, the new uh, one's coming out. Yeah. Okay. So um, again, my math is wrong, but uh, Jen, I'm, I'm directionally correct. Um, so that's a lot of stuff, and I'm sure I haven't even you've and you've got two kids and a wife. Yes. Uh, so that that's a lot of stuff. Uh, how how do you do all of that without losing your mind? I, I, my lesson to most of the people that work with me that lose their mind on smaller bits of that giant puzzle is find a way to every day compartmentalize things. You're not going to push the rock all the way up to the top of the hill and leave it up there ever. So what you need to do is say if there are five projects that you're working on, find out how much do you think at the end of the week you need to propose to work on those projects. And of each day, only give that one that amount of time. Be able to put it away, close the folder, and say, I'll get back to this tomorrow. And in the same sense, unless I'm opening a new restaurant tonight for the very first time, which that day is spent entirely on the new restaurant, I figure out what part of my day and my week and my month and my year can go to each thing that I'm involved with. So, like, you know, the Red Campaign is a big thing in June. Uh, It's about providing the funding for the HIV relief drug that allows people to live normal lives and stops the transmission of HIV from mother to child. And in Africa, it's a really big thing. And I work on it with Shriver and Bono. And it's, it's a lot of fun. The, our month, the restaurant activation month, is June. So May tilts a little bit toward that while we get all of our stuff in order. But by the time it's under roll and moving forward, I, I, I check in on it now. But in the last month, it would take 60% of my time. Now it's only going to take 5% of my time. Mm. So I figure out what, how important the things are. And often, the way to figure that out in my world is, how much money am I making on this? Or how much joy am I getting out of this? Mm-hmm. Or how much social responsibility am I getting out of this? And you kind of figure out where that matches this week. And then you kind of, you really have to say, listen, I can do two hours this week. And I can do six hours next week. And I can do one hour this week. But it, it causes me from feeling, it, it diminishes in my mind the fact that I'm not getting anywhere. Because I didn't finish anything today. But I'm, in fact hurtling small goals at all times. And that makes me feel a lot more confident that I will eventually get to the finish line of what I need to do. I, I'm, just, I'm going to advance my opinion now, so it's worth pretty much nothing. But I sit across the table occasionally from people who claim to be in a state of imperturbability, and I don't believe it. But I sit across from you. And actually, I, I sense you're a pretty calm guy. And is that – would it have been different if I was sitting across from you, say, eight, nine, ten years ago, pre-meditation? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Absolutely. But also, I mean, age. You know, eight, nine years ago, I was an eight, year, eight years younger. I was a little more volatile. Maybe I was a little less confident that what I was doing was working out. And I also had teenagers. My, I mean, my kids are 19 and 18 right now. When they were 12 and 13, maybe it was a little trickier. Maybe it was newer territory. Hmm. But as with all experience, once you become familiar with the v- variety of options and variables, then all of a sudden you know, hey, I've seen this. It can't go that far. Maybe it'll go out to here. And I know how to stop it to get it from there or how to promote it to get to there. 
I actually, I mean, I strong people often talk to me as if somehow meditation has made everything perfect for me. I think it's multifactorial. Like for for me, just for me, it's maturation. I'm, I'm married well. Meditation is part of it. It's just right. one piece. Right. I uh, would agree with you 100%. So you were very, very kind, even though we don't know each other well. I, I reached out to you um, about a year ago and asked you for a big favor, which is that I, at that point I was just launching my 10% Happier app, and I asked you to try it out and make these little videos. Well, I enjoyed you. sending you my little videos from the They beach. were great. And I want to quote from one of the little videos where you said – uh, you, at, at one point, you said that, that one of the things you really took from the, the little lessons from me and my meditation teacher, Joseph Goldstein, was learning to respond and not react. And you said, that'll be a big lesson for me. I tend to go off half-cocked, not prepared, emotional only all the time. Uh, so is that still a problem for you sometimes? I mean, we talked about it just a little Let's bit earlier. Let's put it this way. No one's perfect. But that said, I can usually postpone my response now by a good 60 seconds, which is a mile and a half. Oh, yes. On a long path oh, yeah. toward doing the right thing. Of course. So I'm, I've learned to I, – I, my, my first thing is I try to put on my Bob De Niro face. Hmm. <laughs> and I try to think, hmm. <laughs> hmm. And if I can do that, I, it brings a smile to my face no matter what situation I'm in. Because I know I don't look like Bob De Niro, but I think that he's quite a comical character. And uh, then I try to breathe through and think, what would be the first thing I would say? And what could be the best thing I could say? And then what am I going to say? And if I can get to that point in my mind, I'm already 30% better. No, well, that's Not only 10, 30. Dude, you're probably 1,000% better because that's mindfulness in action right, right there, which is not just saying the first thing that comes right. to mind, which can often ruin the next 72 hours of your marriage right. or your work Or your life or your yes. restaurant business or yes. your whatever. Yes. So it's work for me, but like... Keep in mind, sometimes the funniest things you're going to say are the ones that you don't consider very long. So you have to be able to turn it on and turn it off, right? You know, I mean, it's more in confrontation that I find that to work, but not in all facets of my thoughtful being. I think that's actually an excellent point, and that, and that brings us to the chew, because when you're on the chew, you're very funny, and you... I'm uh, uneditable, too. Ask right, them. you don't want to be, you don't want to overthink everything. Right, no, you can't. Well, I can't. I mean, because I, I, what became very evident at the beginning of the Chew production process was, like, after the third day, they wanted to retape the opening. I'm like, don't let them do it. We can't let them do it. Then it won't feel like a live show, and it'll suddenly feel like one of those overproduced daytime shows that we know a lot about. I said, don't ever, don't, I told the whole crew, please don't let them have us redo it. Making a mistake is actually funnier than doing it exactly right, because this isn't a movie. This is a daytime TV show. And we all kind of got together, including the producers, and we said, yeah, let's just let it roll. It'll be so much more relaxed. Now, that doesn't mean that if I make an um, unsavory remark every now and then, because they pass through my mind, just like my <laughs> sanctity does, <laughs> that every now and then you'll look at the cameraman after a scene, they'll be, they'll be like, that line is never going to make it. <laughs> oh, because they do edit. They'll edit just a little bit, and they'll they cut away. Like, maybe I'm saying something under my breath, or maybe I'm saying something directly, and they'll cut away from it and go to somebody else's face for just a second. When they first came to you with the chew, did you think, I, I have a ton of restaurants, all these books, all this charity work. I, I can't do this. You know, when, I, when it started, because it was, it was going to be a daily show, we thought it was going to be live, which means you'd go on at 1 o'clock and go off at 2. So how early could you have to show up? How, what, how late would you have to stay, you know? And, and because I'm together, like, like when, when the Chew crew needs something done, and there's five of us, and we're all five getting back to them quickly, if they want it done fastest, like they need a recipe really quickly, they say give it to the busiest person because I'm capable of re responding immediately to that kind of a request. So we have our recipes in all in, and everything's all set up. As it turns out, it's not live. It's live to tape, just like most of the TV shows and the late night shows. And, and it was going to be four days, but now it's three days a week. So when we figured out how much time it would take, I figured seven to one, really by the time it's one o'clock, most of my friends are really not, really haven't done that much. It would be a great way to get a jump start on a lot of things. <laughs> and then be on who are you my hang, day. Who are you hanging out with that they're not getting anything done by one? Uh, chefs, A lot of I guess. artists and yeah. chefs <laughs> who open dinner restaurants in the PM. Fair enough. What time do you go to bed? Um, do you get enough sleep? I think so. I, I think I feel pretty good about it. I mean, I'm, I, I've always been the guy that went to bed last and got up first. And that's just because, provided you're not drinking yourself to sleep, I don't need, I could live on five hours for a long time, five hours a night. And then what I believe firmly in, and I'm sure that most of the sleep specialists listening to this right now are going to start writing you a note, I'm a firm believer in sleep banking. 
I think that if you sleep extra for like three months in a row, you have a little cushion you can draw on. <laughs> it's like a little account. I, I, this is an area where I know nothing, so I won't. Well, uh, it's worked for me. That. Like, I mean, I'm not breaking down. I feel healthy. My, you know, my numbers are in the reasonable world for yeah. someone my size, and it looks like I'm performing quite well. Yeah, I think you're performing extremely well. Um, on the issue of spirituality, would you call yourself a religious man? I would call myself an anti-religious man. I'm a firm believer in your own personal spirituality. I'm a firm believer in the energy of the universe being universal. And in fact, that when we come into the earth, it's a brand new piece of something. But when we go into the earth, when we leave the earth, our energy re-enters the flow. And that's ecstasy, and that's eternal, and it's something remarkable. And I'm not worried about death. I'm not sure where I came from to get that spark, other than something remarkable and creative. But I don't believe that there is a deity or a creature who is in charge of this. You are not worried about death? No. Does, why, why, why doesn't it scare you? It's just part of the... It's, it's, it's actually an entry into another ecstatic position of this very piece of energy that's right here. I mean, I'm not looking forward to it. I'm not rushing ahead to it. I'm not taking unusual risks because I want to spend as much time as I can with my family. But like when time comes, I've seen what looks like to me, and I've met a lot of very older people, and half of them are like still smoking a cigar every day and having a great time. And half of them are living in places where they are not having a good time. Yeah. And that's living beyond our expiration date. And I, and, I, and I don't have a problem with science doing that. I'm just not sure that I'm going to want to do that. You had a near-death experience, which I heard you discuss with our mutual friend Brian Koppelman Absolutely. on his podcast. Can you tell me a little bit about what happened to you? I had a cerebral aneurysm about equidistant in the center here, just off of what they perceive to be um, olfactory and taste. Uh, it's when a what looks like a little piece of, I mean, a little piece of uh, your brain uh, bloodstream looks like a little tiny um, inner tube, and there's a little bubble on it, and you're born with it, and that bubble pops eventually. It doesn't have to, but it could be the category of uh, a larger field, or it could be just the weirdest little thing. And it's because they're so rare, they said, well, your children and your wife are now completely never going to get it because it's that rare of a thing. That said, it popped, and, and, I, and it felt like all of a sudden it was like... And you were about to open a new restaurant I was at, I was at the dishwasher machine at Lupa preparing for the wedding of my partner, Jason Denton. And I'm looking over the guy's shoulder, and I say, so uh, how do we make sure the dryer is actually going to go all the way through? And all of a sudden, I was like, oh, he's looking at me, and he's talking to me, and I'm like, what the heck is he saying? And I'm like, this is either a flashback or something. <laughs> and I went outside, and it, it kind of subsided. And then for the next, like, six hours, it just felt a little bit more like a a headache in the back of my neck. So I went to the hospital. I went to the Cabrini Hospital on 19th Street and 2nd Avenue, and they said, let's take an x-ray and see what you got. And they took a, something, and it looked like a giant ping pong ball in my head. They, they said, we can't help you. We're going to have to move you somewhere else. And this is on a Friday night in the summer in New York City where there are gunshot wounds and angry cut people and just the crazy situation. So they took me up to another hospital. I kind of rested for the evening. A doctor came in the next morning and said, we have to operate. You have an aneurysm and we need to go in and clamp it, which they subsequently did. How lucky were you to survive? Five out of ten die immediately. One out of five has... Four out of five of the remaining five have permanent damage. And so you were the one out of ten? One out of ten. Ten percent. Happier. Yes, hey, you know what? I thank you for keep bringing it keep back. Keep bringing to that I, back. I like, I, you're, you're, you're a man who knows how to brand. Um, what impact... Did that have on your outlook, your way of being in the world? Well, my first question to the doctor, is this a result of lifestyle or bad decisions? He said, no, this is congenital and whatever it is. So I'm like, well, okay, that feels better. At least I didn't screw myself up. When people ask me, how much did it change your behavior or change your life? I was already someone who was so deeply in love with my life and, and, and the things I get to do and realizing the giftiness of it, that it didn't change me that much. Yes, I, I made it past that unusual and... I would hate to say fated experience. But, I mean, if it was congenital, it was kind of fated, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, but not mm -hmm. fated like someone's up there, you know, playing the puppeteer. But, you know, I, mean, I still love my kids as much as I did before. And I love my wife as much as I love before. And I've gone on to create a lot more product. And I think Koppelman's point was this was a transition that made you more productive. You know, there's Alan Ducasse, famous chef, was in an airplane crash, walked away, the only one that survived, and suddenly became the most three-star Michelin chef in the world. I'm not sure. And I, I asked him about that. I said, how much did that change you? He said, you know what it did? It made, it made me waste a little bit less time. 
Hmm. Which is a very interesting way to look at it. Like, if your perception of wasting time is just merely lounging around in leisure, I'm not sure that's a waste of time. I think maybe wasting time on projects that weren't going to come to fruit is probably the better way to kind of figure that out. And I've tried to edit that, but I, you know, I'll, I, I, I'm still. I mean, we have 28 restaurants. We have 4,000 employees. That when I was at that point, I had, I was opening. It was my third restaurant, and we had 80 employees. Brian Koppelman, just for. For those who don't know who he is, he's one of the writers of the Showtime show Billions. He also has a podcast called The Moment, which is definitely worth listening to. Yes. Um, you, you, you mentioned and a pretty good golfer. Is he a good and golfer? And an R.E.M. fan, which is where we bond, bonded first. R.E.M. and golf brought us together. I, I know nothing about golf, even though I, bro- I grew up on the back nine of a golf course, but they didn't let Jews in. Uh, but I love R.E.M., so I yeah. will share, so that. I, I share that passion with you. Well, you mentioned Alan Ducasse. I, how, much, how much competition is there among elite chefs? Do you get, you get, you get some pangs of jealousy when you look at these guys? There's a difference between jealousy and competition. Jealousy is like when someone does something really good and you're just proud of them, but you're also like, man, that's so great. I wish I'd thought of it first. But you, you can't possibly think of everything first. You know, I'm incredibly jealous of my good buddy Tony Bourdain. He got to have lunch with President Obama yeah. in Hanoi. Yeah. So, like, there's jealousy, but it's not like you want to do him bad. Actually, what you really want to do is sit down and have a beer and talk to him about what they really said that didn't get made to the, you know, the, the eater.com or wherever the hell this information lives. But, like, in, in, in New York City, having we have 10 restaurants in New York. For us, we don't have to beat anybody to get the customer in our chair. We just have to be good enough that they remember to come back. Because a lot of restaurants fall by the side or the, or the roadside or the wayside because people forget to, to, to hear about them. Because yeah, yeah. they're not, they just haven't been on the press or they haven't done anything or, or they haven't changed their menu or whatever. I mean, 20 years ago, it wasn't like there was instant virtual simultaneous newscasting of the chef putting the oyster on the plate like there is now. So it's a lot easier for chefs and restaurateurs to play in the game of the PR world than it used to be. But some people are better at it. And also some people are, by definition, just doing something that's more challenging or more newsworthy than making a great hamburger or a great you know, cheeseburger or a lobster salad or whatever. So for us, the thing is to be in a good position so that as the city gets busier, all boats rise at, you know, at, at that tide. And when it goes back down, just to make sure that you're paying attention to the contraction so that you're still making profit, meaning you don't have as many people working on the floor, as many people in the kitchen. Like we look at it as something that kind of ebbs and flows. And the success of that is not having a full walk-in on an empty week or a full staff on an empty night. So we pay attention to that kind of nuance because we're, we're multi-unit guys. Maybe a smaller restaurateur isn't starting to think like that. The... the the competition versus jealousy issue we were discussing a moment ago. Have you gotten better at that with time? Did you? Did you? Did you yeah. Well, you, I mean, realizing that I had my position already set, not set, but I mean that we had had a great success, and, and I measure my success by how many of my good pupils have gone on to open their own restaurants. Like hmm. that. That for me is a good thing. I like them to move on and show their greatness or eventually become partners with me. As we, like Josh Lorano at La Sirena, was a sous chef at at Del Posto, then he was the chef in the morning at Babo, and then he was the PM chef at Lupa, and now he's a chef partner. And having that happen means as I go into the kitchens and into the dining rooms of all the restaurants, I say, listen, look at Josh Lorano, or, or look at uh, a wine waiter who is now the wine director for, Jeff Porter started as a wine waiter, and now he's the wine director and beverage director for five restaurants. Like I say, listen, you pay attention, and you do the right thing. And you show up early, and you stay clean, and you do the right thing all day long, and stay 10 minutes late to make sure everything's in order, you could possibly be my partner. I mean, there's that Yiddish term, naches, you know, like the, yeah. this kind of warm and fuzzies. That must give you some naches to see these people that you helped sort of raise oh. in the profession go on and, and to soar. use another phrase, I would kvell about them forever. <laughs> that good use of Yiddish, Batali. When we come back, what is the thing you're working on now that nobody knows about that you're most excited about? Stick around. Welcome to the Bishop Gray Academy, the country's most exclusive boarding school, a place where the best and brightest aren't fighting to be prom queen or captain of the football team. They're on track to become the next Supreme Court justice. Academy is a new scripted podcast that follows Ava Richards, a brilliant scholarship student who must quickly adapt in a school where rules mean nothing and money means everything. Ava sets her sights on being the first scholarship student to make the list. Bishop Gray's all-coveted academic top 10, curated by the headmaster himself. 
But with no clear path to the top, she joins the Knight of the Wolf, Bishop Gray's underground society with more secrets than the Illuminati. If she bends to their demands in exchange for her own success, one of the 10 coveted spots will be hers, but at what cost? Enjoy Academy on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. Binge all 10 episodes of Academy early and ad-free on Wondery Plus. Join Wondery Plus over on the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts. Academy is a new scripted podcast that follows Ava Richards, a brilliant scholarship student attending Bishop Gray Academy, the country's most exclusive boarding school. Academy takes you into the world of a cutthroat private school where power, money, and sex collide in a game of life and death. Binge all 10 episodes of Academy early and ad-free on Wondery Plus. I know the answer to this, but I think our listeners might be interested to hear it. How did you start cooking? You know the answer? That's interesting. Um, well, Stuff all of my your family. Face. Uh, exactly. Stuff well, that was my first face. professional job. Okay. But I mean, we started cooking when I was growing up in the eastern side of Washington State. We cooked, like, we pickled everything. We made on the Eastern pasta. side of Washington State. So I was born in Seattle, then side. I moved to Yakima, oh, gotcha. okay. then I moved back to Seattle, and then we went to Spain to go to high school. And in all of that time, in the summer, we would forage for wild berries, we would make pickles, we would make all this stuff. And everyone, men, women, everybody, all my aunts and uncles, all my cousins are great cooks. They oh. just never, it was, keep in mind, when I became a cook in 1978, it was the last thing you did after you got out of the military before you went to jail. Like, it was the <laughs> lowest common denominator. Anybody could peel potatoes to help make soup. So it was not the job your mom would brag to your neighbors about. And it just turned out to be the right time. So all of my cousins are all working. You know, some of them, they're such obsessive fly fishermen that they went to work for Boeing so that they could have access to these microfiber, um, super elastic stuff to build their fly fishing rods. Like, uh-huh. they're crazy that way. So we grew up in a very family, I mean, a very food-obsessed family. Then, when I got to college and I needed some money, I went to work at a place called Stuff Your Face in New Brunswick, New Jersey, which, if you haven't been, it merits a visit. They make strombolis, two sizes, large and huge. And it's, <laughs> everything is fresh. Like, they were miles ahead of the farm-to-table market. Like, we were, they were making broccoli or cauliflower or mushroom strombolis, not with canned stuff or pickled stuff, with fresh stuff, just rolling it inside that pizza dough with a little tomato sauce. It was delicious. And I believe it was three eighty-five for a large and $7 for a huge. Still, still, the price is have to I think they've gone up a bit, but I, I, and I don't know the answer to exactly, but it's still a good value. So did you go to Rutgers? Is that what? Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. And uh, after Stuff Your Face, what happened? I graduated and I went to the Cordon Bleu in London. And then I worked for oh. this crazy guy named Marco Pierre White, who was the youngest, at first British born kid to win three Michelin stars, and the youngest kid to win three Michelin stars at that time, back in the 80s. What do you think of veganism? I think vegetables are excellent. I think a plant-based diet is a, a very healthy way to extend your life and probably increase mobility and, and certainly get rid of issues with you know things that happen when you're when you're swelling. Uh, inflammation. Inflammation. Yeah, yeah. But for a for a chef, like it's it's easy for a vegan or a vegetarian to come to one of my restaurants because we use predominantly extra virgin olive oil and like pasta with vegetables we have on the menu without anybody having to say i'm a vegan what are you going to make for me like we have a lot of vegan opportunities that said as a chef to remove an entire category of stuff would be like telling titian i'm sorry titian we're out of red what would you like to work with on this case (laughs) and so for me i'm i'm omnivorous and i'm and i'm proudly so but like i must say that compared to my diet 20 years ago i'm eating a lot more plant-based stuff than i used to does does, does the animal cruelty argument resonate with you somewhere i'm not a vegan i eat i had i eat a lot of meat and dairy and all that stuff but somewhere in my brain the animal cruelty argument is nagging at me. what that we kill them and eat them or that we mistreat them and then kill them that that part see I, i think what what where the where the movement has gone in the meat world and the poultry world is treating the animals better makes them taste better it costs a little bit more but it's a price a customer is willing to pay so they'll pay more for really good meat. So you're not getting factory farm no, meat? No, of course not. That would be a bad business move for me. Just because it doesn't taste as good. Well, it just doesn't taste as good. Like any opportunity to upgrade the flavor of something that I'm making, and it means also buying at the green market and not buying at wholesale because the green market guys have no interest in selling me something that they could sell at full price to a regular customer who's still going to show up at 4 o'clock. We get it at the green market at 6.30 while they're setting up, and we get the best strawberry or the best asparagus or the, the best mushroom. Like it's important for us to have that because capturing that 
evanescent, that ephemeral flavor of the way the wind blows through the Hudson Valley on a Thursday afternoon right before they harvest stuff is what makes our food more distinct. It, it, it's, it's not cheating, but it's a faster and easier way to get your food to taste really good because it's geospecific. Like it tastes like what it's supposed to taste like. So if I'm worried, and I am, about animal cruelty, just don't eat factory farmed. Well, yeah. I mean, do you know the word cafo? No. It's the feedlots that they use for factory farming. And you look at a picture of this stuff, and it is, it's as if they are submerged in shit. I mean, they're, they, they can't have a good day, these animals. And the super small uh, chicken coops that are just packed in, you know, yeah. and, and they're using chickens that were crippled. You know, it's just like if you buy things that were grown kind of naturally, like they were 80 years ago, you stand a much better chance of that animal having a much better health system in its own body, you make sure they don't have antibiotics or growth hormones, and already you can tell, like, you get a steak every now and then, you're just like, geez, this is just tough and not very tasty. That was growth hormone meat. Mm. That's why it's tough and not tasty. So how do I know when I go to the store? You go to a store that tells you exactly where they are. For example, Italy. Like, we tell you exactly Your, why tell you. I say it's mine. It is mine. Well, let me just tell people what it is. Italy right. is this emporium of uh, E-A-T-A-L-Y. Correct. Right here in Lower Manhattan, it's just a crazy, like, Epcot center for the most amazing food right. on earth that you opened with a partner or two? With my partner, Joe Bastianich, and then okay. the Farinetti family and the Saper family. Anyway, so I just wanted to set the tone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, that, at Italy, It wasn't supposed to be an illegal plug. What it was No, 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 I like plugs. If you can go to a place who is about the transparency of information and everything about Italy is that, we want you to understand exactly what you're eating, and it's all about biodiversity and slow food. That said, when you go to the to the butcher counter, they'll tell you where this veal was from, where this lamb was from, where this beef was from, how old it is, what it's got. And then if you're really interested, you can go to their website and find out exactly what they fed these animals and how they treat them. That's awesome. And I that's why it costs more. I, I, Italy's amazing. And, and just can I just say something about illegal plugs? This is a podcast, man. You should, you should plug away. People who are <laughs> listening to this, they want to know everything about you. Oh, so you just go. plug everything. All right. um, especially since everything you do is pretty much awesome. What's the deal with the orange Crocs? My wife... When we were just starting to date back in 1993, we got married in 1994, uh, gave me these orange Italian operating room clogs called Calzuro. And I think they went out of business. But right when they were going out of business, Crocs were just starting. And I discovered them at the Aspen Food and Wine Festival because they started in Aspen as shoes to go fishing in streams with. Because they, they would drain right out and leak. And uh, orange was clearly my family color because my wife helped me choose it. It is the color of happiness. Um, I stuck with them, and, and I take a lot of heat on the fashion blogs, but none in the comfort blogs. Well, what do the people on the fashion blogs they say? They hate it. They think this is ridiculous. And a, a full-grown adult in his 50s wearing plastic shoes is, is pathetic, and I'm like, oh, yes, I'm comfortable and I'm pathetic. <laughs> and it's just like, whatever. That said, there's another story to the orange, and I'll tell it to you, because the very first time I was able to take my children out without my wife and go to the Houston Ballpark, which is... So it's, it looks, it, from where we grew up, you would call it a parking lot. It's Houston and 6th Avenue, right next door to Da Silvano. Okay. There's a basketball court oh, yeah, and a yeah, place yeah, where, yeah, like, that's where all our kids would hang out when, when I was growing up. And when they were about two and three, two and three and a half, it was my day. I took my kids out for the first time. And I'm sitting over in the corner and I'm watching them and they're playing. And then I start chatting with one of my buddies. And he said, uh, where's Benno? I'm like, because at that point in the village... And this is in the uh, late 90s. All the kids were black or gray because we were groovy New Yorkers. And it occurred to me that I couldn't see my children. So the very next day, we got them yellow and orange coats. And I could pick my kids out from a long ways away without any of the discomfort. I had immediately thought I'd killed my children or they'd been kidnapped. <laughs> and they hadn't. They were playing on the other side of the field just as innocently as they would have been if they were in front of me. But I did not have complete control of the situation or even marginal control because I had to go look around carefully to see if I could find them. Now that they're 19 and 20, do you still dress them like they could get lost in a snowstorm? Or I, I don't dress them anymore. Yeah, you're not allowed. They wear their pants lower than I would ever tolerate. <laughs> and they are much groovier. And unfortunately, they're both kind of into these luxury brands. And I'm just like, you know what? This is it. This is the last year. Next year, when you're making some kind of money, like maybe making $10 an hour or whatever, whatever minimum wage will be that year, You'll look back on the days that we bought you that pair of Yeezys or whatever the heck it is or whatever jacket it was that you wanted that we don't even know what. Like Hell's Angels? No, that's not that. There's some company with something about God. I don't, I don't even know where these clothes come from. But they're there and they're expensive. I had read that the orange Crocs were actually discontinued and then you just stockpiled them. Well, because I'm a part-time spokesperson for Crocs. 
uh, they paid, told me paid for this. Well, they give me like a, you know a piece of business on the ones that have my signature on them. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, and they said, "Listen, we're discontinuing your orange." I'm like, first of all, that's a stupid move. That's the best color there is. You guys have." Apparently, it was not the biggest seller. Um, People were reading the fashion blogs. Not, notwithstanding, notwithstanding your, my uh, incredible, whatever you want to call it. And uh, so they said, "Listen, we're closing the color." I said, "Well, listen, can you run me a few pair?" And they said, "Well, how much?" I said. Well, like, what's a, what's a small batch? And they said, well, a small batch is 2,000, but we can do a micro batch of 200. I said, 200. I quickly did the math. I used two and a half pairs a year. Yeah, that's a lifetime supply. I'll take them. <laughs> so they're hanging in my office across these little strings. And when I need a new pair, I go get them. It's like for a big fancy event. Like if I was going to have dinner with Obama, I'd get a new pair out because they're shinier. So you actually only wear these. If you had dinner with Obama, it would be Crocs. Oh, you- Completely. Not patent leather, not, like Crocs. Obama's not impressed by your shoe selection. He'd be more impressed that you chose something that he didn't recognize. Is there anything, any occasion that would be formal enough for you to, to ditch the Crocs? What do you mean formal? You mean like dress every, like everybody else? No, there isn't one of those. I will wear these to my children's wedding if I'm still wearing these shoes. Because they're comfortable. And it's a signature. All right. it's, like, it's like, ask Martha, Martha Stewart, what do you say? That's a good thing. She'll say that for the rest of her life. It's a signature. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I, I, I solicited some questions for you on Twitter. Uh, one of them. What are some of the up-and-coming, under-the-radar ethnic cuisines that might be next to go mainstream in the U.S.? I, I don't know that they'll ever get mainstream. But the varied cuisines of China and India, which have a very good foothold now on the seven-train path out into Queens, mm-hmm. are some of the most exciting cooking going on. Their use of spice, their use of unusual protein or extra offal, uh, their way with noodles, their cultural understanding of the magnificence of the entire animal is something that is inspirational and delicious. And for me, not something I'm that familiar with. But I will go out with a guy like Jonathan Gold or Tony Bourdain or anybody who happens to pay attention to the, that space, and we will take the 7 train deep into Queens and taste food you've never seen before. Uh, I don't think it's going to be in Peoria next month, though. You know what I mean? But it could be eventually. Right. I would say what's going to take Peoria next is I think vegetables are going to move a little bit toward the center of the plate. I think we're going to try to get rid of super high-fat proteins in in a way that's not good for your body and yet still be able to eat cheeseburgers every now and then. I, I would hate to give up cheeseburgers. I don't think we have to. I just think you can't eat five cheeseburgers in five days. And I think the processed carbohydrate is the big protein. I mean, the big... Uh, the big issue there is getting rid of any kind of bread or starchy product that has been removed from all fiber so that you will eat a 900-calorie muffin and be hungry in 10 minutes is going to go away. Do you have a favorite meat to barbecue slash smoke slash grill out? Barbecue is the slow roasting of meat through smoke. I love the pork shoulder. Grill, I like a skirt steak because it's inexpensive and delicious. And smoke, I also like making my own brisket or bacon. What is the thing you're working on now that nobody knows about that you're most excited about? We're going to open four Italy's in a year's time. Whoa. And we're working on a green gastronomic theme park outside of Bologna. Wow. So it'll be about food decisions, but it'll all be interactive I'm not sure if we're having rides yet, but we're trying to figure them out. But the, the fact that you can go in and get kind of the information that everybody should know in a child-friendly and adult-friendly way in the same place, kind of like a Disneyland, Disney yeah, World. The, the Italians eat, make good decisions already. Why not? You need this in America. Well, I don't know if you're aware of our number one export to Europe, but it's obesity and diabetes. Yeah. They're trying to fight it and figure it out right now because they're kind of savvy that way. What do you say to – back to meditation and then I'm, then I'm going to leave you alone. Um, what do you say to somebody who's interested in meditation but they just can't make it happen? I tell them it's just like anything, like, like moderation, like political tolerance. Try it. And then if it doesn't stand naturally, try it again and keep going back at it. I have probably told a 1,000 people about 10% happier. Because it's a very low threshold. They can easily jump on that. And they follow up on it. And some people don't do it. And I was just have, uh, talking with my uh, good partner from the Spotted Pig this weekend. He said, listen, I just can't do it. I said, well, if you couldn't do it, try it again this week. See what happens. It's not, a, it's not, you, you don't have to fire every day on it. But if you find that it makes you relaxed and make better decisions, why wouldn't you just do it a little bit more often? Like, do it for a whole week in a row and tell me how you feel. 
because he's like me. He's young, younger than me, but prone to like saying quick things in a time when it would have been better just to wait another 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. If you can do that, you can, you can minimize damage. You can maximize profit by everyone liking you just a little bit more or you being tolerant of variations in behavior and strategies at doing the work that you've hired someone to do in a way that makes it a lot better. I have a good friend. His name is Sam Harris. He, we're not related, but he's, uh, he's, a, he's one of my spiritual leaders in the non-religious character okay, so business. Sam Harris is a, is a great friend of mine. He has this thing about he's a big meditator, and he talks about the difference between the amount of damage you can do in two minutes of anger versus an hour and a half of anger. Right. And that is where the rubber hits the road with meditation. It's incalculable. Right. Two minutes of anger, you know, maybe a few bad things can happen. Hour and a half of anger, lives can be ruined. Right. It's huge. Huge. And I would agree with him. Mark, I would agree with just about anything Sam Harris said, though, you know, I must say. That's a smart, a smart character. It's a smart policy f- to follow. Uh, Mario Batali, one of the world's greatest chefs, and a very, very cool man. Thank you very much for doing this. My pleasure, sir. All right, there's another edition of the 10% Happier Podcast. If you like it, I'm going to hit you up for a favor. Please subscribe to it, review it, and rate it. Uh, I want to also thank uh, the people who produce this podcast, Josh Cohan, Lauren Efron, Sarah Amos, and the head of ABC News Digital, Dan Silver. You can see a video version of this podcast at abcnews.com. And uh, hit me up at Twitter, Dan B. Harris. See you next time. Hey, hey, Prime members. You can listen to 10% Happier early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen early and ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, do us a solid and tell us all about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. 